burial again, you will have the opportunity to do that. We'll post that up. Uh, and so that will be available. But uh, really my role is just uh, the pleasure and privilege of being able to introduce you to this uh, session. As most of you know who are on this call, IDEAS is uh, really something of a revolution of advancement and process simulation uh, uh, capability. Uh, fully integrated simulation and optimization capability that really goes far beyond the kind of tools that are out there in the, in the market today. Uh, and so uh, we're very excited about the opportunity to get more of you using this tool and feeding back to us as to what things work, what doesn't work for you, and what kind of features you'd like to see. So uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. And uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity to have you be uh, regular partners with us in further developing this capability. So uh, enough words from me. Uh, let's get on to the more important stuff and I'll pass the baton to, to Keith. Uh, and Keith, bring us in. Okay, thanks John. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little demo and a walkthrough and I hope people can follow along um, if possible. And I'm going to show you how to do uh, the download and installation of the IDS PSE framework. So I'm going to start this by sharing uh, a screen. How does that look? Can people all see my uh, my Windows uh, environment here? Yeah, Kate. Great. Can you just hold on one second, Keith? Let me do something really quick. And, sure. Uh, sure. I'm just going to mute everybody just in case, just to avoid any accidental sounds, although everyone has been great so far. And, all right, that's... Okay, you, you muted, you, I unmuted myself, so that's... That good. was why I wanted to do a little pause here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's all good. Um, okay, so what, what, what you are seeing right now is uh, a Windows, it's actually a virtual machine. So this is, it's going to run a little bit slower than I think than it would normally run. Um, uh, if you had a native Windows running on your uh, laptop or whatever, <clears throat> but I'm going to start with um, uh, I'm going to start by creating a folder. Now this folder could be anywhere, but I'm just going to put it on the desktop because it's easy to find. Um, so that's just a brand new folder, and that's going to be the place where um, files that get added, um, like where the examples are going to be, which we'll get to in a second. So. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, my Anaconda prompt. Now, I think some instructions were sent out earlier for people about installing Anaconda. Now, Anaconda is, it's, it's not some of our software, but it's a system that allows you to have multiple different Python environments and then keep those environments separate from each other. So it can be very handy if, you're, if you want to um, make one Python package installation um, and have that package and that and all of its requirements separate from a different one. So um, I can show you, um, if I do a combo info environments, this lists all the different environments that I currently have installed on this machine. You see I have, there's a base one, which is kind of the one that's always around for everyone. Um, I try to avoid that and just keep that one kind of clean. Uh, I also have a hello world and as you can see I have one for CCSI because that's another project that I work on So this is a good example where work that I do on CCSI. I can keep separate from work that I do on, on IDS um, So also just so you know, I've got this is the little script that I'm working from here, which I'm totally willing to willing to share with you people um, after this so let me get into the IDS folder. Okay, so there's nothing in there. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new Conda environment. Uh, and this is going to be the Conda environment in which I will install IDS. So that's, I'm gonna, that's the name, IDS PSD. Uh, that could be anything. You could name it anything you like, but it, that doesn't matter. Just remember what it is and you'll use it again. Uh, and I'm saying to create this kind of environment with a Python Python version 7.3. So it's telling me what it's going to install. So that's going to go through and um, install several packages into this pip environment. Um, okay, so there it finished. I get into that environment by activating it. ASPSE. 
And one of the first things you'll notice is that the prompt here got changed. It, I was in the base environment, and now I'm in the IDS PSE environment. And you can do commands like pit list, and that'll show me the packages that I have installed in that particular Conda environment right now. Um, so what I'm going to do now is actually install um, IDS. Um, PSE, and that's going to go out, and that's going to download and install the latest uh, version of IDS. Now, this so this pulls it. This is going to pull in several different packages. Um, so it's going to take a few minutes. So I thought um, while this is happening, I thought I would try to describe a few things. Um, the um, one of the things to note is that if you're doing an upgrade. This, it would be the exact same command. So if you're going from an older version of IDS to a new, newer version, you would just type the same thing, pip install IDS-PSE. And what that'll do is that'll, that'll basically upgrade any packages that need to be upgraded. The great majority of them aren't gonna be touched because they're packages that we um, require and those packages probably aren't gonna be changing. But if there is a new version of IDS, um, it'll basically uninstall the old one and install the new one over top of it. So that's, <clears throat> I know that was one question that people came up with. Um, so um, another thing is, um, I know a few people have problems with proxy errors at this point. Now, um, that one I don't really have a good solution to because a lot of times what that is a problem with is, uh, like if you're on a corporate or a network, you know, your, your institution has, a firewall setup that doesn't allow you to go to certain websites like the ones that we're pulling the packages down from, there'll be some problems there. I don't really have a solution to that other than try to talk to your networking people and see if you can work out, either allow them to have you download from that those websites or um, uh, I, I suppose you could try to go around your company's VPN or firewall, although I wouldn't suggest that. Um, uh, Keith, one comment on that, um, because we have the same issue at Cyndia. Yeah. Um, the way I've found to resolve that is you can create a .conda.rc file in your home directory oh. and add the, the proxy sites that you need to that file, and Conda will pick them up, and then everything works fine. Oh, so okay. So I will, I will paste in the chat the contents of mine to, to help anyone out that's facing that same issue. Oh, that's great news. I didn't know about that. Thank you, Bethany. That's, that sounds really good. Um, okay, great. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you guys is that we have, I'll show, this is on my little web page here. I'm going to open this up. So this is, this is where our documentation is hosted. We hosted on a site called Read the Docs. Um, and so this is a good place um, where hopefully all of your questions can be answered. Uh, 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 basically the documentation. I'm pretty much following the instructions here on the installation instructions for the Windows environment, uh, downloading Ana uh, Anaconda, or Miniconda, which is just a smaller version of Anaconda, um, is um, I'm basically following the same instructions here. Um, so uh, uh, that's the Read the Docs site. There's other ways to get a hold of us. Um, we've I recently set up a few, a new, IDS users email list. Um, that's an addition to, there's also a stakeholders list that's been around for a long time. There's also an I, IDS, these are the email addresses I have here, IDS users uh, at IDS.org. We also have a support list. So um, you can feel free to um, send us emails at that. I hope that, um, my hope is that the IDS users list could be one kind of a discussion list for users to be able to ask questions and get questions answered. Um, that can be valuable even if you're not the one asking questions, you can see what other questions people have and what their answers are. I find those sorts of things to be really helpful when I'm trying to learn a new tool. Um, there's also GitHub. You could you can open up an issue on GitHub. So all, the, all of our development is done on GitHub. It's all fully open source. And so you could, if you wanted to, open an issue and ask us a question that way. You could even open a PR and if you wanted to actually submit changes back to us, um, we're always welcome to that. Welcome for that. Um, 
Okay, so this is still going, and I got through my list. Does anybody have any questions so far, or anybody else want to mention something? Uh, one thing, Keith, is there have been a few people who have arrived since you started. Um, you might want to just scroll back and show them the commands in case they want to try to catch up. Okay, sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for those who have just joined, um, I basically I'm walking through the installation of IDS um, PSE, and so and this is on a Windows machine. Very similar steps would work on a Linux uh, machine, also on uh, a Mac. There's one caveat on the Mac, but, but I'll get to that. Um, so I, I basically created a folder on my desktop. Um, it's empty at the moment. I created, um, opened up the Anaconda prompt and got into the Anaconda prompt and um, kind of showed how I have, there's a list of Conda environments, how they kind of keep your Python uh, environments separate from each other. Um, I then created a new Conda environment with this command there that I'm highlighting, Conda create. Uh, the name of the environment's not important, but I do want to specify Python 3.7 as the Python version to be used in that environment. Um, I then activated the environment, um, which is basically getting into that environment. And you'll see that like the prompt changes, the prompt kind of indicates, it, it's an indication for you which kind of environment you're in. Um, and then I did the, the pip install ideas PSE command, which is does the installation of it. So, and that just finished, great. So now what I want to show you is if I do a pip list again, which is the same command I did before, you'll see that I have a whole bunch more packages in here. And the one we're most concerned with is the ideas PSE one, which is 151, which is um, the 150 release was done a while ago. Um, as a result of us preparing for this, we found a small little bug that got fixed. So that's what the point one is for. Um, things will still work if we're working, uh, the 150 release, but uh, uh, there'll be a small hiccup, but it'll still work. Uh, okay, so what this has done then, we can now show you. Here's another way. So I've got ideas version. Um, and it's showing me that I have version 151. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll do, we'll do this. Do this um, there's this ideas command that's, that we have in here that it's pretty helpful. It has several different sub commands. So what I'm gonna do first is get the, get the extensions. And these are basically a list, these are basically several binaries that we have pre-built for you um, with a bunch of solvers already pre-installed. So what that does is that basically just downloads some binary files that we've already built for you with um, solvers built in with some extensions that you wouldn't be able to get. Uh, we just tried to basically build some stuff for you ahead of time to ease um, the use of these solvers, like IP ops and um, that, that sort of thing. So one caveat here though is that we don't currently have those solvers for the Mac environment, we're working on it. It's, we should pretty soon have them available for um, the Macintosh, but we don't currently have them yet. For those people on the Mac, you can get um, kind of a vanilla version of IPopt using that command there, conda install, uh, see conda forge IPopt. Um, it's just won't have all of this, all the solvers that, um, um, that we've built into our extensions. So, the next thing would be to install our examples. So right now there's nothing in this directory that I started with creating get examples, it's basically the same sort of thing. Right now, because we have a slightly newer version of the examples than we do uh, IDEAS, I wanna grab specifically the 152 um, that examples. Actually, there's a command here I can show you where you can list the examples that are available. So I'm gonna grab the latest one which is uh, the 152. Now, this is another feature that we're working on, making this a little bit easier so that you could just run get examples and it'll just get the right version of examples. We haven't finished that yet, but that'll be happening in, in the next release of ideas. So that should reach out, grab the examples and install them <coughs> both into your kind of environment and into, okay, so you can see that we've got the one point root two. 152 version, do a little list, and you see now we have an examples subdirectory that this is 
a little bit extra, which you don't need to look at, but um, that's another thing that'll be cleaned up with the next version. So at this point, the installation is complete. And so um, now the next step would be to basically start trying to use uh, the framework. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is I'm going to show you how to start a Jupyter Notebook um, with two zero codes. So this will start up Jupyter, which runs its own little web server, so you can see it opening in my web browser. So now what I'll do is I'll, get, I'll navigate into that examples um, directory that was downloaded, but oh, too far. Um, and then I'm going to open this kind of top level index notebook that's right in the top level. So here we have a notebook that has, I'm going to make my browser a little bit bigger here, um, that basically is um, where we can have, it's, it's basically a list of all the different tutorials that we've prepared. So um, from here, uh, we can go into one of the tutorials. So let's, as kind of a proof of, uh, Proof of concept, let's go into the first one. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna step you through the very first um, step of the notebook. Uh, so these, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar people are with Jupyter Notebooks, but it's basically, it's like this web page that's interactive where you can run Python commands. And the simplest thing to do is you just type shift enter and you can go through these cells. So right now, this first cell is highlighted where I'm going to run a Python script. And that script is a very simple one, and it basically just goes through to make sure that everything is working correctly. So hopefully everything is working correctly. And just did a few different checks. It checks that, that the PyOMO import um, works correctly. Um, Bethany's going to go into a lot more details about that after me. Uh, it made sure that importing IDEAS worked correctly. It checked for the availability of certain solvers. So And then it, and then it did a simple model check. So this is just kind of a, a smoke test, a, you know, a proof of concept that the installation was is successful. So that is basically the extent of what I wanted to try to cover. Um, does anybody have any questions they want to ask before I hand things off to Bethany? You guys are hearing my little clicks. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, do I see any questions? I wonder if I move this out of the way. No? Nope. Is there okay. an um, online copy of the instruction list that you had pulled up a little bit earlier? Um, there isn't at the moment, but I, I, I can send that out afterwards. Um, yeah, this is basically, I mean, I started this just as my own notes, so I knew what to say. <laughs> but I'm, I'm more than happy to share that with you. I'll, maybe I'll send that around to the, um, to the user in the stakeholder list later afterwards. Um, but I can, I, can, I can certainly share this with everyone. Um, yeah. Oh, it's a good thing you mentioned that because there was one thing I was just about to forget, which is that, um, so for people who are, who are going to be rejoining this, um, you know, we have another session in the next, you know, next week. Um, what you should, all you should need to do to get back to where we are is, um, basically quit out, I mean, you can, you can just basically open up your Anaconda shell, get into that environment with the Conda Activate PSE, and then start your Jupyter Notebook again. Um, and then, yeah, and then navigate to uh, the page that you want to get to in there. So uh, you, would, you don't need to reinstall IDEAS, um, you just need to open up your terminal uh, and start the, you know, activate that Conda environment and then um, start the Jupyter Notebook. So, okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, so, uh, Keith, uh, this is Jaff here. Uh, if you would stop sharing your screen, we are going to do the. Uh, we've connected over WebEx. So, I'm going to share my screen, but we'll be seeing Bethany's screen via WebEx. Okay, great. Hope, hope this works. Let's see.
Okay, can everyone see my screen, seeing Bethany's screen? Yes, we can. So. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, Bethany. Okay, thanks so much. Um, right, good to go. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I guess that's the, uh, the risk when you're doing any kind of live demo. Um, all right, so uh, Keith left us off uh, kind of at the top of this module zero um, welcome notebook, and everyone should have run this first cell here just to verify that everything's uh, installed and, and running correctly. Um, so the, the purpose of this first introduction module is to really introduce you to uh, some basics of Python as well as Pyomo. Um, so one of the, the primary benefits of using a tool like Ideas is that it is implemented in a uh, fully featured uh, programming language, which means that you have a lot of flexibility in how you uh, manipulate data to load into your uh, flow sheet or different unit models. Uh, but you also have a lot of flexibility in doing analysis after you run, uh, let's say, a flow sheet simulation or some kind of uh, optimization study. Um, and so, so the purpose of this module is really just to introduce you to some basics of Python uh, that will help you uh, with doing some of those uh, kind of extra features that you get for free from uh, working within Python. Uh, so. At the top here, you'll see a little bit of an overview of some of the other workshop modules that we have available. Uh, some of these will be covered in uh, future online sessions that we've already scheduled. Uh, so I'm just going to skip down here to this introduction to Jupyter Notebooks and Python. Um, and so uh, this kind of just gives a brief overview on some of the, the Python-isms that we'll be talking through today. Uh, these include um, things like if statements, writing simple loops, and working with different data structures within Python, including lists and dictionaries. Um, and then we'll also highlight some other Python packages that can be really useful uh, when you're working with Ideas models or, or doing things in Python, uh, and you'll be able to uh, see kind of what that looks like. Uh, we'll have an example uh, showing how you can store uh, some data. Uh, and you can also use this extra package to, let's say, load data from a database um, as well. Uh, so this is not meant to be a completely comprehensive uh, tutorial on Python. Uh, if this kind of piques your interest and you have um, other questions or other things you want to do with Python, uh, there's lots of other uh, online tutorials that, that you can take a look at. And feel free to reach out to the team if, if you'd like recommendations there, because uh, we know about lots of these different resources. All right, so let's jump into some of these interactive exercises here. Um, the first thing to know about Python is that you don't need to declare variables before you use them. You can simply define a new variable and assign it a value. Uh, you don't have to tell Python what type it is. That's inferred automatically. Um, and this makes it really easy to get started. Uh, so this first exercise here, uh, we just want to assign a value of x, uh, a value of 5 to the variable x. So we can do this uh, using the line x equals 5. OK, so far so good. Um, the next thing. Uh, for this second inline exercise is we want to print the value of x. Uh, there's a built-in print function in Python, uh, which we can use to do that. So if we type print 5, uh, 5 gets printed out here below. Uh, and in Jupyter Notebooks, um, any output resulting from uh, this cell being executed uh, will just get displayed below the cell right here. All right. Uh, the next exercise, we want to change the value of x to 8. Uh, so we can do that by saying x equals 8. Um, all right, so far so good. And now I want to draw your attention to um, one of the unique things about working in Jupyter Notebooks that, that you should keep in mind as we go through this module 
uh, because it, it, it can trip up uh, new users as well as uh, you know, seasoned users of, of Jupyter Notebooks. And that is uh, that you have to be very careful when working in Jupyter Notebooks with the execution order. Um, it's important to know that uh, these different cells that we've been executing, they can be executed out of order. And the state of your variables and imports and, and anything like that is defined by the execution order, not necessarily the, the order that the statements are written in. So to illustrate this, um, we just ran this line where we set x equal to 8. If we go back up to the previous cell where we printed uh, the value of x, uh, we can run this again. And now we see that the value of x is 8. Okay, and um, Jupyter Notebooks kind of give you some clue that this is happening by uh, printing out the uh, little numbers in square brackets here, which are an indication of the order that cells have been executed in. So you can see um, this x equals 5 line was executed as the, the second cell, um, then the next, uh, the next cell executed jumps down to this x equals 8 and then back up to the print. Um, so, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, you want to be very careful if, if you ever make a mistake and have to go back up and execute a previous cell uh, to um, just be really careful and pay attention to kind of the order here if you're getting any kind of unexpected behavior. It could just be that some of your cells were executed out of order. Um, and Jupyter Notebooks include some nice uh, tools and commands to um, to help you kind of reset the state and, and make sure everything's working as you would expect. Um, so this first one that's mentioned here allows you to uh, restart the kernel. Uh, so that's kind of restarting this Python environment that we're working in uh, and clear all the output. Um, this second command that I'd like to draw your attention to um, allows you to select a particular cell and then run all of the cells above it. So this uh, essentially uh, allows you to, let's say, to stay in a particular cell um, and go back and the Jupyter Notebook will sequentially run all of the cells that came before it. Uh, so just to show you how that works, um, so this next inline exercise, we're going to uh, tell the kernel to restart and clear its output. Uh, okay, it's, let me completely restart it. Not sure why I'm getting a kernel error there. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, Bethany, that token should be printed out in the command line where you, when you started the notebook. It's usually okay. a big me, long. Let me just restart that quick. You can either restart the whole thing or go back and look for that. Uh, yeah. For anyone that's okay, having trouble hearing Bethany, uh, I, I think she's quite clear, but um, I think some people, a couple people had some issues. You know, I guess, Bethany, if you could move it as close to the mic as you can, um, that, that'd be great. But <clears throat> just turn up your volume. Um, I think her, her volume is consistent, at least. So if you turn it up, it should be fine. OK, sorry for that. I'm uh, connected through my phone audio. Uh, so I don't know if that's playing into it or not. I'll try and move it a little closer. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good to me. Okay, so uh, I just restarted my my uh, Jupyter notebooks here. I'm not sure why that uh, why we were seeing that error, um, but let me just go ahead and uh, rerun these cells that we already executed. 
uh, just so that I can show off the um, the commands here that I mentioned. Okay, so we had print x here, and then we changed x to eight. Okay, so now if I go up to kernel and I say restart and clear output, you'll see that the output that was here below this print line has disappeared, it's been cleared, and all of the numbers in the square brackets here have also been cleared. Um, okay, so this, this essentially resets the notebook to its Pre, its initial state where none of the cells have been run. Um, so now what we can do is we can use this other command uh, called run all above. And this is under the, the cells tab. So if I click run all above, then you'll see um, the little stars in square brackets mean that that particular cell is queued to run. Uh, and then after it's actually executed, it gets replaced with a number here. So now you'll see that all of the cells uh, above this cell, which I had selected before running this command, have now been executed in order. Okay, so those are just some, some useful quick tools um, to know about when working with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so now if we print X again, it's set to eight. Uh, which was the last line that we executed before rerunning the print statement. All right. So now uh, let's dive into um, some Python structures. Uh, so this code is showing an example of an if statement in Python. Um, so we're declaring a variable called temp and setting it to some value. Uh, and then the structure of the if statement uh, looks like this. Uh, so we start off with if and then some logical expression um, and then we follow that by a colon. Uh, the next line uh, is what gets executed if this logical expression evaluates to true um, and you'll notice that it is indented by four spaces. Uh, something to note about Python is that um, all of this the structures here are all defined by indentation. Um, so unlike you know, MATLAB or C++ or, or other uh, high-level programming languages, the structure here is not defined by like curly braces or, or a start and end or anything like that. It's all defined by indentation. Um, so it makes it you know, nicer to read having aligned indentation, but it, it's really critical in Python um, just because it, it, it is what is used to define uh, kind of what's in scope and out of scope for this if statement. If you, um, some other clauses that, that go along with this statement um, are ELIF. Uh, so these are kind of checking different conditions. Uh, if this is false, then it will check if this logical expression is true or not. If this is false, then it will uh, default to the, the else at the bottom here. And in all cases, the, the logical expression is followed by a colon. All right, so the next exercise here is to write an if statement. Um, so we want to set the value of a variable t degree c to 20. All right, that's already done for you. Uh, we want to convert that, uh, convert degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the expression for that is also already done for us. Uh, and then the last step here is to write an if statement that prints a message if the degrees Fahrenheit is below 70. Uh, so we can do that by saying if t degree Fahrenheit is less than 70. And you'll notice after you uh, hit enter following a colon, the Jupyter Notebook is smart enough to automatically indent for you, which is nice. Uh, then we will print um, the room is too cold. Okay, uh, so now we run this and uh, our statement gets printed out here. 
um, uh, we can easily change things around here, but, but that's kind of the general idea of a simple if statement. All right, the next thing uh, that we're going to cover are a few different Python data structures. So we'll start with a list. Um, you can think of lists as similar to vectors or arrays in other languages, but something to keep in mind uh, is that in a list, um, the indices start at a zero in Python. Uh, so this is different from other languages like MATLAB, where the indices start at one. In Python, they start at zero. Uh, so the, to access specific elements of the list, you, you would go from the index zero up to the length of the array or the list minus one. Um, lists can contain uh, lots of different uh, standard data types. Uh, or they can even contain uh, Python objects. All right, in the next exercise, um, we are going to create a list that contains the values from zero to 50 uh, by steps of five, and we'll also be introducing another Python uh, logical structure, a for loop. Um, we'll be utilizing the range function to uh, to generate a range of numbers, and we'll also be using the append method to add values to the end of our list. Okay, so those are all of the kind of new Python things that we'll be working with here, um, and our exercise is to complete this code uh, in order to, again, print out a list with values from 0 to 50 with steps of 5. Uh, so you'll see here that we created an empty list uh, using uh, the list command with empty uh, parentheses. Then we're going to write a for loop that uh, is going to loop over um, a range of values. The so range 11 uh, will return the, the numbers uh, 0 to 10. And uh, for every number in that range, it's going to get passed into this i variable here. Uh, and the loop will loop for every value in that range. All right, so in order to create uh, this desired list, all we have to do is say xlist.append. Um, and then i being passed in here will be from 0 to 10. So in order to get steps of 5, all we have to do is multiply i by 5. Uh, and then the last step here, um, back outside of the for loop, is to just um, print the list. So if we do that, you'll see that we've now generated um, that desired list. All right, one of the other really cool features of, of Python uh, is called uh, list comprehension. And what this allows us to do is essentially take uh, these four lines of code here and do, do it all in just a single line. Um, and so the way we do that is we use square brackets to indicate that we want to create a list. Uh, we put some expression for the individual elements uh, that will define that list. Uh, and then we can use um, this, uh, it's called generator syntax in Python, uh, for essentially doing the same operation that we had up here that was, again, uh, looping over uh, different, different values. All right, so now we're going to uh, redo this same exercise that we did previously, but we're going to do it all on one line using a list comprehension. Uh, okay, so we can do that by saying x list equals, and then square brackets, uh, and then we'll say i times 5 for i in range 11. Okay? Now, if we run that, you'll see that we were able to create the exact same list as we had before, but in a lot less code. Uh, so this can be pretty handy. 
Uh, and there's other kind of neat things you can do with list comprehensions. Uh, you can add if clauses to the end of them uh, to, uh, to only add elements you know, in this range if a certain condition is met. Uh, so it gives you a lot of flexibility um, and a lot of power to, to do some fairly complex things in a very concise amount of code. Uh, all right, so one other thing, uh, one other method you can use with lists uh, is the len function, and this will uh, print the, uh, the length of the list. So this next inline exercise is to print the length of x list. So we can do that by saying print len x list, and it prints the value of 11. Um, we can also uh, iterate over lists, similar to how up above we were iterating over the range 11. Uh, we can also iterate over a list of values. Uh, so here we want to create a new list called YList, and we want every value in YList to be the square of uh, one of the values in X list. So we can do that by saying for my x value in x list, we want to append it to y list, uh, and we want to append the square of that. Um, so this is this is one way to write that. So x times x, and if we run that, uh, you'll see that it gives us the desired result. Uh, another way to um, write exponentiation in Python is to use a double asterisk. Uh, so if we do x double asterisk 2, uh, this will also uh, give us x squared values in our whitelist. All right, we can do the exact same thing using a list comprehension, just like we did previously. So here we're going to say y list equals and then square brackets, uh, and we will say x squared for x in x list. And again, uh, just put a print statement here. Oops. And again, what this is doing is it's looping over every individual value in x list evaluating this expression for that value of x and then adding it to this new y list uh, list, okay? All right, so that's uh, a quick overview of, of lists. Uh, there's lots of other um, methods and kind of neat things you can do with lists, but those are kind of the basics. Uh, the next data structure in Python that is used quite frequently are dictionaries. Uh, and what these allow you to do is map a key to a value. Um, so uh, there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, keys in a dictionary can be almost anything. Uh, so that can include things like floats, integers, or strings. Uh, and then the value piece of a dictionary can be uh, kind of anything you want, um, including uh, other Python objects as well. All right, so this next uh, inline exercise shows you how to create a simple dictionary. Um, and this dictionary is being used to store the areas of uh, some of the states. So you'll see that we create a dictionary called areas uh, using the dict command, and then we can add elements to that dictionary by specifying a key in square brackets, and then specifying uh, the value that we want to associate with that key after the equal sign here. Okay, so if we print that out, um, this is what a dictionary looks like. You can tell it's a dictionary because it's in curly braces here. Uh, and you'll see that it's printed out with the key and then a colon and then the value associated with that key. All right. 
So uh, dictionaries can contain mixed types, uh, and that just means that all of the values that you add don't all have to have the same type. So you could add another key value pair, um, like the one shown here, where you're using uh, the key Texas as a string and then using a value as, uh, really big as a string. Uh, but you have to be really careful in thinking about how this dictionary is going to be used by uh, kind of other functions. Um, so, you know, whatever whatever function you're using to process this dictionary uh, should be able to handle whatever uh, data types get passed in as the values here. Uh, so, you, so you just have to be um, kind of careful. Uh, all right. So there's a number of uh, nice ways to iterate over different pieces of the dictionary. Um, so this is again showing how you can create a really simple dictionary. We have the keys A, B, and D, uh, and they're associated with uh, the integer values 2, 4, and 16 respectively. Um, so the first way that we can iterate over kind of the values in this dictionary is just to iterate over the keys. Uh, and what this does is it will only print out the key values. So that would be A, B, and D uh, get passed in as, as the K here. Um, something to note about dictionaries is that they can be, well, they are unordered by default, um, which means that there's no guarantee that these are going to get printed out uh, kind of in the order that you specify here. Um, so you just have to be uh, careful, especially if you're doing something that, uh, you know, requires repeatability or uh, like a deterministic ordering. Um, it can be useful to, in many cases, sort these keys before you iterate over them, but um, that's kind of a, a, a detail. Um, to access specific elements in the dictionary, you just use square brackets with the value of the key. Um, so, so that's what's going on here. Another way to iterate over dictionaries is just to loop through the values. Uh, so this loop is going to just loop over the value portion of the dictionary. So that would uh, loop over the 2, 4, and 16. And then a third useful way to iterate over dictionaries is to use uh, uh, the items method. And what this does is it returns both the key and the corresponding value. Um, so that, that's what that one looks like. All right, so the next inline exercise here, uh, we want to take the areas that we had in this dictionary up here, which were written in square kilometers, and we want to uh, make a new dictionary where these areas are converted to square miles instead. All right, so the... A uh, new dictionary is going to be called areas underscore mi. Um, we're using the dot items method to iterate over our original um, areas dictionary. And we're passing the key into the variable state name and the value into the variable area. So now to add a new uh, a new entry into the areas underscore mi dictionary. All I have to do is say areas mi square bracket of the key, which is going to be state name. And then for the value, I'm going to take area uh, and note that the, the conversion between kilometer and miles is given here in the uh, note. Uh, so all we have to do is 0 0.62137, uh, and then squared, because we're going from square kilometers to square miles. OK? So now we can go ahead and run that. And uh, you'll see this new dictionary with now the squared uh, miles values here. And uh, Python also supports the notion of dictionary comprehension. So these are 
much like list comprehension, they allow you to create dictionaries in a very concise amount of code. Um, so this is an example of what that looks like. You do that in curly braces and specify the key and then a colon and then the value that you want to associate with that key. All right, so now we're going to redo the same exercise as we did previously, but using a dictionary comprehension. And we can do that by saying uh, areas underscore mi equals, and then curly braces, uh, and then we'll say key colon value times uh, 0.62137 squared. And we're going to do that for uh, every key value in our original dictionary areas dot items. Oh, and then we'll print that out. Okay, and now if we print that out, you'll see that we created the exact same dictionary as we had previously, but we were able to do it in just uh, one line of code there. All right, so that's a quick introduction to dictionaries. Um, and, and again, really the reason that we wanted to do a quick intro to um, these data structures um, is really that these are the most common uh, data structures that you will see in Python, and they can be incredibly useful uh, for uh, loading and, and, and storing uh, model data and uh, kind of manipulating IDEAS models. Uh, and I think you'll see that when we get into some of the later modules in future sessions. All right, another uh, useful thing that you can do in Python is uh, plotting. Uh, and so the next couple exercises demonstrate how you can use an, a different uh, Python package called matplotlib uh, to generate uh, some, some quick uh, figures. Um, and if you've ever used uh, MATLAB for plotting, I think you'll find uh, some of the, the code and the interface here um, rather familiar. Um, so let's just jump into it. Uh, all right, so the first uh, cell here is showing how to use uh, the NumPy package to create a list of 15 evenly spaced intervals. Um, and so this is using the linspace function from NumPy. Uh, and this is what it looks like. We're going to uh, import NumPy as NP. And then we're going to use the linspace function from NumPy, and we're going to generate a list from 0 to 50. And the third number here is, is saying how many points we want uh, within that interval. So we do that to generate uh, an X list, and then we generate a Y list, which is just the squared of every, uh, the square of every value in X list. All right, so we run that, and this is what it looks like. Um, again, for xlist, you'll see that uh, this linspace function generated points between 0 and 50. And if you counted all the values here, you would see that you have uh, 16 points. OK, and then the, the y list is just the squared uh, value of all the values in, in xlist. All right. But just printing out the, the output here, um, it can be useful for you know, just quick checks, but it's uh, not the easiest way to, to look at you know, large amounts of data. Uh, so, so let's use matplotlib to uh, plot the X list versus the Y list here. And uh, we're just going to go through like some really basic commands that are available in Matplotlib. Uh, if you want some more information on uh, kind of more detail and, and all of the awesome features in Matplotlib, there's a link here to the Matplotlib uh, documentation. Um, I found that you know pretty pretty much any uh, figure that 
I was able to generate using MATLAB, I can do something very similar in Matplotlib uh, to, to generate it, kind of the same figures. All right, so we're going to import uh, matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And then we're going to create a plot of uh, xlist versus ylist. Uh, I'm going to set the title here along with the x-axis label and the y-axis label. Uh, you can create a legend uh, for your different data sets. And then this last command here just says uh, tells the plot to appear. So if we run that, we see that we get a nice, um, a nice figure here. And there's, you know, some extra bells and whistles you can do, kind of similar to um, plotting in in MATLAB. So if you wanted to display the individual points, you could tell it, you know, a period there. Uh, I think that will have the points and then have them connected as well. So there's a lot of um, little formatting things you can do to customize this plot. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, an inline exercise where we create a plot of sine of x. So uh, we're going to create um, a list of x values from 0 to 2 pi with 100 points, and we're going to use the numpy linspace function to do that, similar to before. Uh, for the sine function, we're going to import that from the math package. All right, so let's get to the code. First step is we're going to import math. Uh, then this line is already in here for you. This is creating the list of x values from 0 to 2 pi and uh, says to get 100 points. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is create our y list. So this is going to look like this. We're going to use list comprehension again. And here we want to say um, we want to use the sine function from math. And we're going to take the sine of i for i in x. OK, so again, this is going to loop over all of the values in x and pass them in as i. And then for our y list, uh, we're going to take the sine of all of those values from our original x list. So now to generate the figure, uh, I'm going to be lazy and just copy this code down here and then edit it as needed. So it's going to be plot.plot .plot, um, and then our x and our y list. And this is plotting the uh, sine of x. Uh, our x label can stay the same. Our y label is going to be the sine of x, uh, and then I'm not going to change the legend. So if we run that, you now see that we're able to um, see the plot of, of sine of x from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? All right, so that's just a quick intro to using Matplotlib to um, visualize lists of values. Uh, this can be really useful when working with IDEAS models and, and PIOMO models uh, to uh, kind of visualize results. All right. So the last um, external Python package that we're just going to briefly touch on is called Pandas. Um, this is a really useful package for importing and exporting data. Uh, so whether your data is coming from an Excel file or a CSV file, or you want to take results in Python and export those to an Excel file or a CSV file, um, Pandas is a really convenient mechanism for doing that. Um, so again, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here. The Pandas documentation uh, is, is linked in this Jupyter Notebook for anyone interested. Um, but this, uh, this inline exercise, we're just going to execute this cell. And what this is doing is it's importing pandas. It's creating a data frame, which is kind of the, data, the, the main data structure in pandas. Uh, and within this data frame, we're going to store our x values as well as our y values, which again are the, the sine of x. 
uh, we'll print out the data, fun data frame so you can see what that looks like. And then we're going to use Pandas to save this data to a CSV file. So we can run that. Uh, when we print the data frame, this is what it looks like, just a, a, you know, a table of our X values and uh, the Y values. And if we um, go back to uh, the, the list of files um, that, uh, that we have, you'll see that uh, this new CSV file has been created. So if we look at that, um, you'll see here are all the, the values that we had in Python before, but now they're saved to a CSV file. Uh, and again, this is only done in, in just a couple lines of code. So Pandas is, is really, really convenient for importing and exporting data. All right. Um, again, if you want any more information on these external Python packages that we've touched on, the documentation is all linked here. Um, this is just kind of a taste of some of the, the really cool extra features that are available in Python. Um, but of course, there's a lot, a lot of others that we didn't have time to uh, really dive into in this, this tutorial. All right, the last little section here is a quick introduction to Pyomo. Um, Pyomo is an object-oriented um, modeling language uh, that's written within Python and is what the IDEAS framework is built upon. So when you create IDEAS models, under the hood, you're creating uh, Pyomo models. So, so these couple lines here are, well, this section is useful for showing you um, just some quick basics on how to work with and manipulate Pyoma models. And you'll see a lot of these same steps uh, in the future modules as we start working with IDEAS models. Because again, an IDEAS model is a Pyoma model. Uh, this isn't a full tutorial on Pyoma. Uh, if you want more information uh, and kind of a, a deeper dive into Pyoma, there's some really good uh, tutorials and documentation resources on the main uh, Pyomo GitHub page, so I would direct you direct you there. All right, the first step here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to import a couple of things from Pyomo. So we're going to in import a model object as well as a variable object. Uh, we create a Pyomo model and then we're going to attach two variables onto that Pyoma model, so X and Y. Okay, and we execute that, and we don't have any print statements, so nothing's going to get displayed there. Um, but this is just kind of setting up a base model that, that we can work with. Um, all right, this next uh, set of text gives you just a really quick overview on how to declare objective functions as well as constraints in Pyomo. Um, so you can see that uh, this first uh, line of code here shows how to, how to declare an objective function. And the expression for that objective function is just going to be x squared. Um, and this is a perfectly valid objective function. You could just you know, leave it there. Uh, the, the default is that an objective function will be minimized. Um, so if you don't see anything saying otherwise, uh, you should assume that the objective is being minimized. If instead you want to maximize an objective function, you can pass in this maximize uh, keyword here. And this will change the sign of the objective function so that you'll be maximizing the expression here instead of minimizing. Um, and of course, all of these um, kind of extra uh, extra bits here would need to be imported from Pyoma.environ. Uh, all right, the next line here shows how to declare a uh, scalar constraint. Um, so here we're specifying the name of that constraint and we're putting it on our Pyoma model. Um, I, sh I should have mentioned with the objective function, but this name um, and the name of any of these PyMO components can be anything you want it to be. Uh, so they're not like a reserved word or anything that you can name it whatever you want. 
uh, we're going to create a constraint object, and here we're going to pass in this expression for the constraint. So x squared plus y squared uh, is equal to 1. So this is declaring an equality constraint. If instead we wanted to declare an inequality constraint, we could just replace this double equal sign with a less than or equal. All right, so that's how you declare uh, simple constraints. Uh, and again, you would have to import constraint from pyoma.environ for that to work. All right, so now for the second to last inline exercise here, uh, we're going to uh, complete this cell and add in an objective and a constraint here, and then uh, go ahead and solve the model. All right, so um, we want to add, this is, this is the problem that we're trying to model. Uh, we want to minimize x squared plus y squared. And we want to add the constraint that x plus y equals 1. So the, the model has already been declared along with our x and y variables, so we don't have to do that again. We can just go straight into writing the objective function. So we say model.obj, and obj could be any name you want. And we're going to create an objective object, and the expression that we want is model.x squared plus model.y squared. All right, so that's it. That's all we have to do to declare our objective function. And the default is to minimize, so we don't have to specify a sense here. Um, it will be minimization by default. The the last step we have to do here is declare the constraint. So I'm just going to call it con, and we're going to declare a constraint object, and again, pass in the expression. This is going to be model.x plus model.y equal to 1. Okay, and again, this is declaring the constraint x plus y equals 1. All right, so that's all we have to do. We've declared our objective and our constraint. And then the last couple lines here show how to uh, solve the model that we just created. So we're going to use the solver factory uh, and tell it that we want to use IPopt to solve this model. Then we call the solve method. We pass in our model. And then this last keyword argument here, t equals true, uh, this just tells the, the solver to print the solver out to the screen. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then the last couple lines here are just printing some of the results after solving the model. So we're printing out the value of x, the value of y, and the value of our objective function. And this value function is another thing that we've imported from Pyomo. So this is how you get uh, values out of Pyomo uh, objects. So if we go ahead and run this, uh, you'll see this bit at the top is the solver output from IPopt. Um, this is, printing the solver output is really critical as you're debugging models and trying to, con trying to check that things converge, trying to check that uh, you have the number of variables and constraints that you would expect. Um, you can see the, the solver status at the bottom here. So we found an optimal solution. And then our optimal solution is, is printed here. And again, this is from these three print statements that we had before. So our optimal solution is x and y. And our objective function are all equal to 0.5. Now, after your model is debugged and everything's working perfectly, if you don't want to print the solver output, uh, you can set t to false, or you can just completely remove this keyword argument. If we, uh, oh, so, all right, so this is because I didn't rerun this cell first. So let me rerun that one first, and that will give us a new model object. And now if I run this again with t equals false, you'll see that the solver output is no longer printed out, and I'm just seeing uh, the values of my variables and objective function here. All right, the very last cell down here just gives a little bit more information on how to um, 
different ways to look at your model. Um, so there's a P print or a pretty print uh, method that you can call on a model or really any other uh, Payamo object. And this allows you to print out different information about those particular objects. There's also a display method. Um, and let me just run this so you can see the difference here. So, so the output from pprint gives you, um, you know, a lot of detail about, uh, so like, here are your variables. Here is the currently assigned value of those variables. But it also prints out information like lower and upper bound, uh, whether the variable's fixed. Uh, the domain of that variable, uh, so stuff like that. The objective function, when you pprint, will print out the expression for the objective function. The same for constraints. The expression of those objects gets printed out. When you do model.display, the, the only difference is really in the objectives and constraints. Instead of printing the expression, the value of those expressions gets printed out. And those are evaluated at the current value of any variables in those expressions. All right, so those are, those are two um, other useful tools for looking at Pyoma models, but these same things work for looking at different pieces of an IDEAS model as well. And so, so this is the way you would print out a whole model, but if you wanted to just look at a particular component, you could say, uh, for example, model.x print and this would just print out oops. oh t print helps if I can type uh, this will just print out that pretty print output just for the variable X all right um, so that brings us to the end of module zero um, if there are any quick questions that haven't been addressed in the chat, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, I will hand it back over to Jopper. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, so any questions, you know, feel free to like uh, send it via chat or through email or uh, until I get set up, uh, you can also unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. We can. Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, so in the last uh, 15 minutes, uh, what we had planned was uh, basically just to give a very brief introduction about the days and and but uh, and what makes it uh, different. And also, this would be a nice segue into our next two tutorial sessions where we will actually be working with uh, ADS models and, and we'll be showing you some of the uh, you know, cool features uh, with, uh, with ADS. So uh, first things first, <coughs> Keith sort of briefly hinted at this during the installation step. Uh, uh, we have a question for Bethany in chat. Andrew, you want to? Ask that question. Um, so somebody wanted to know what the difference between a concrete model and an abstract model was. Bethany, you wanna? Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Um, the difference between a concrete model and an abstract model uh, it it really kind of just means whether you're creating a like skeleton model. So an abstract model you can think of as a skeleton model where you then look in the data later. And this kind of follows if you're familiar with uh, the ample modeling language, kind of their um, their separation of the model from the data. Uh, whereas a concrete model, things are kind of constructed as as they're executed. Uh, now, you can anything you can do with <coughs> an abstract model, you can do with a concrete model. Uh, so, if you're just starting out with Payamo, I would recommend kind of only working with concrete models. Um, but that's kind of the, the quick difference between the two. 
All right. Uh, thanks, Bethany. Oh, we have there are more chats, I guess. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, with regard to this, um, uh, the documentation is available on Read the Docs. Uh, we constantly update the docs to make it more easier for users. So, welcome feedback. If you uh, you know have any comments to improve it, uh, such that the usability is improved. Uh, the second thing is that what what is a this right? So over here, uh, you know we're showing this uh, on the x-axis is the time required to develop a model, and then on the y-axis is an effectiveness uh, of the model for uh, optimization. Now uh, more commonly used, the commercial sequential modeler platforms, uh, you know, uh, fall in this space where the time required to put together a flow sheet is relatively small, but the at the same time the effectiveness for optimization is is not really great. Uh, the the second block you have uh, your commercial equation oriented platforms like ACM or GPROMS. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, here you might have to start a bit from scratch. Uh, there's also a modeling library that you could take advantage of, but at the same time the accessibility to solvers is again uh, limited. Now on the extreme right is, is the algebraic modeling platforms like GAMS and Ample or, or Pyomo. Uh, uh, the, the, there you got to like really model everything right from the properties, the thermodynamics to the unit models, everything coded up your, yourself. Uh, and, and what typically happens is that uh, these codes or these code bases are typically legacy models, but the advantage of that uh, AML platforms is that you have access to like really good optimization solvers. Now what ADES is trying to do is basically to fall into the space uh, where the time required to put together a model is relatively short, but at the same time, the effectiveness for optimization is, is really high in the sense that you have some of the, uh, the advantages that you get from AML platforms, but at the same time, we get rid of the, uh, you know, the, the accessibility with regard to the modeling uh, uh, unit models and, and and so on and so forth. So that's basically the objective of uh, where ADES is trying to like fit into this uh, space. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, the it's it's a next generation multi-scale modeling and optimization uh, framework. Uh, we, we the, the basic idea is to try to bridge the gap between uh, process simulators and AML uh, algebraic modeling languages. Uh, our application areas or our focus primarily in the past a uh, couple of years has been uh, on uh, working with existing fleet to improve the efficiency and reliability. We work with existing power plants. Uh, we deploy, uh, we have used the days for data reconciliation, parameter estimation of a real power plant. Uh, at the same time, we are using a days for conceptual design, for process synthesis, uh, design studies, uh, for accelerating the development of uh, advanced uh, energy systems. Uh, the, the, the main, uh, uh, difference is basically is that we have built it from the ground up keeping optimization in mind so it it allows you to optimize uh, steady state and dynamic processes uh, it's purely equation oriented uh, and at the same time we provide you with a library of models uh, uh, basic thermodynamic property packages that allows you to put together a particular combination uh, for a flow sheet and, and and straight on get into the optimization part and it's built uh, on, uh, as Bethany pointed out, uh, we, we have basically built it on top of Pyomo, and Pyomo is built on top of Python, and that gives you access to a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, extensions uh, through Python because it's uh, built on, 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 on uh, the Python programming language, especially for data analysis, uh, visualization, and, and numerical uh, packages. Now, <clears throat> this is basically a good sort of an overview as to how we uh, have gone about with the ADES modeling structure. So everyone, we typically, we are aware of, like we start off with the process flow sheet and we start to put together a certain set of unit operations which consists of a unit models, some thermodynamic properties associated with that, and that makes up your process flow sheet. Now this is typically like, you know, known from commercial uh, tools, uh, but what we have also done is that at the, at, at the core of ADS is like this uh, uh, block structure where you can, uh, we have also built in some core capabilities that we automatically write some mass balances, 
some performance equations uh, depending on. So you, if you want, you can completely bypass our library and straight away access the core uh, blocks to put together unit models for your processes. Now, once you have the process flow sheet, uh, that's where uh, you know now you have access to do a lot of interesting things with that process flow sheet you've put together, uh, which is like you could optimize that entire flow sheet, uh, for, uh, use that for a conceptual design uh, and solve superstructure optimization problems, use that for parameter estimation and data reconciliation. Now, within a day, we have demonstrated all of these four uh, things listed over here, and in the next two tutorials that we have planned, you would actually see uh, optimization and parameter estimation uh, case studies. Uh, uh, so, so I, I, we highly encourage you to attend uh, the the next two tutorials to sort of get a brief idea as to how uh, you know how easy it is to sort of set something up and to optimize. Uh, at the flow sheet level, and also uh, what we do with regard to some uh, flash calculations and so on and so forth. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this for in the interest of time. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the most important thing is that these are purely equation oriented, so they are solved simultaneously. And you can basically specify an outlet condition and, and try to figure out what the inlet should be. So, uh, there is, uh, as long as the degrees of freedom, uh, meaning that, as Bethany pointed out, like your number of constraints and number of variables are equal, while you're solving a square problem, you can basically fix and unfix uh, an, an outlet condition or an inlet condition depending upon the need. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have a well-defined hierarchical structure, so we will get into uh, a bit more about this as we go along in the next two tutorials uh, next week. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we have um, uh, a lot of structured uh, Sort of setup, uh, you know, within a day is, that makes us uh, that makes it really easy to sort of uh, for initialization purposes and 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 and, and all all of that. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is that as I as we uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the specifications and and the degrees of freedom they are all on the unit models uh, and and in. Uh, so we, we do this on the units, uh, and, and again, you have access to a lot of Python libraries. So some of the basics that were shown today uh, with regard to the Python data structures or with regard to the plotting capabilities, we'll be using that uh, going forward. So that's one of the uh, the advantages of a day is, uh, you know, to, to do sort of post analysis once you've solved a model and stuff. So I just sort of end this with uh, uh, you know, giving you a brief intro of what we have planned. Uh, you know, you would have seen the meeting invites with some details about it, but this sort of gives you a little more detail. So in, in the tutorial on May 13th, we'll be looking at a, a flash unit model, which is one of the, uh, you know, it's, it's a tricky uh, model to solve given an equation oriented approach, uh, because uh, we have to handle some uh, smooth phase transitions and we'll sort of show you how we uh, are able to transition between uh, a purely vapor phase to a two-phase region to a liquid phase. Uh, at the same time, we'll be then using an NRTL property package with a flash unit model uh, to sort of estimate the parameters for a binary benzene toluene mixture. So they'll, we'll be doing two modules uh, on May 13th. And then on May 14th, uh, we will actually be solving an entire flow sheet, uh, specifically the HDA process. Uh, we'll set up the flow sheet. Uh, we will tell you how to connect to unit models, how the arcs work, uh, and uh, how are we initializing using a sequential uh, decomposition uh, technique. And then uh, also, we'll be demonstrating a simple optimization example on this entire flow sheet where we'll be minimizing the operating cost. And then we'll show a brief demo that's not available with the current release, but it's uh, coming soon uh, of some uh, uh, post solve visualization tools that will help you sort of like, you know, uh, sort of see a flow sheet and like, you know, sort of access and, and access your uh, uh, stream uh, data and stuff. So with that, I'll just sort of end with uh, any questions from today. Uh, if uh, we didn't have time to answer your questions or anything, please send uh, an email to adairs, support at adairs.org and we'll be more than happy to get back to you. Uh, with that, I see that we have some questions. so. Let's look at that.
So Andrew, uh, could you just? So um, the main question we've got at this point is, um, for those who couldn't attend the tutorial on the 13th, are we going to have a link for the recording out before the tutorial on the 14th so that people could be prepared? Uh, we, um, yeah, we, we are recording these sessions and we plan to put them out uh, up on our website. Uh, we will try our best to put that up because considering that it's on the very next day, we'll, we'll try our very best to put that up. Uh, um, if not, uh, uh, these tutorials are sort of like sort of hands-on are very self-explanatory. You can basically try it on your own. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, to any of us and then we'll be happy to help you. But we'll definitely try our best to put these up uh, on the same day. Any Any other questions? Okay, so um, as I said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, on adays-support at adays.com, adays.org, or uh, just reply to uh, the meeting invites and then we'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. Uh, John, uh, Shin, or Keith, anyone, any closing comments? Yeah, I will just say thank you all for joining in. It's great to have you all with us. Uh, please do follow up with Jaffer uh, on any particular questions you may have had, or uh, and uh, you know join us next week and get more of uh, more about Ideas. Uh, thanks for bearing with the preliminaries today. Uh, I'm sure you see that they are important to get to know all that. And thank you, Bethany, for running through all that. Um, but uh, look forward to having all of you join us next week. So thank you for being on today and, and, and hit us with any questions that you have about anything that you've seen, uh, seen today that you didn't quite understand yet. And thanks to the team. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.